Welcome, everyone. We're so glad that you're here on this Friday afternoon for Critical Data Futures. We have a few more people coming into the space um, as we get checked in, but I thought I would get us started because we have a lot of wonderful discussion and um, viewpoints to be shared um, in this roundtable discussion. Um, welcome to Critical Data Futures Colloquium Roundtable. And this opening session of our full day of events is called Art, Life, Data, and the Metaverse. My name is Lisa Wymore, and I am faculty advisor for Berkeley Arts and Design, um, which is part of the Discovery Initiative here at Berkeley. Uh, please don't miss the afternoon sessions in the Art Practice Building starting at 2.30 p.m. There's a map on the back of your program, and we have extra programs in the lobby if you didn't get them. Um, this whole entire colloquium is sponsored or put on by the Human Technology Futures Faculty Group. It is sponsored by Computing Data Science and Society, the Human Technology, oh, I already said that, the Berkeley Center for New Media, the Center for Science, Technology, Medicine, and Society, the Department of Art Practice, and the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Archive. We are um, sitting in this wonderful Barbara Osher Theater. Many thanks to our collaborators here at BAM PFA. Before we begin, we recognize that UC Berkeley is located in the territory of Huichin, the ancestral and unceded lands of Chochenyo-speaking Ohlone peoples, the successors of the sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County and the confederated villages of Lashon. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from this use and occupation of this land. Since the institution's founding, the history of prolific artistic and technological development in this region has always depended on this land. Um, here at Berkeley Arts and Design and here at the museum and part of this colloquium, we're committed to supporting the sovereignty and ongoing stewardship of this place by Ohlone peoples through building long-term reciprocity and relationship building with tribal and leader organizers. This event is being live streamed with captioning. Welcome people who are streaming in. Um, and it will also be, av be available um, on the Arts and Design YouTube channel and the Human Technology Futures website with the captioning. So if you know of friends and family or acquaintances and colleagues that want to have access to this uh, wonderful roundtable today, please share that. I'd like to introduce you to Professor Karis Thompson, who has a few opening remarks to share. Karis is the Chancellor's Professor and Associate Dean for Campus Partnerships in the Division of Computing Data Science and Society. She is the author of Making Parents, the Ontological Choreography of Reproductive Technologies, and of Good Science, the Ethical Choreography of Stem Cell Research. She is a recipient of UC Berkeley Social Science Division Distinguished Teacher Award and an honorary doctorate for services to science and society from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. She served on the World Economic Forum, Global Future Council, and Technology Values and Policy, and the New Field Working Group on hum Human Genome Modification, and was visiting professor for science in the state at the Princeton Institute for Advanced Study. So I welcome you, Karis Thompson, and I welcome you all to this day of discussion. Um, welcome. It's really lovely to be here. It's such a treat, actually, to be with uh, so many long-term colleagues and uh, creative people I look up to and have for many years, and also to welcome our guests and audience. Um, I'm also here in a, as, uh, in, to give a few introductions, um, maybe a, a couple of uh, conceptual introductions as well. Greg uh, invited me to connect it to some of my, my work, uh, so... Uh, around the concept of ontological choreography, which was my first book, kind of comes from a philosophical, uh, um, a really old philosophical uh, conundrum, which is how is it possible that everything that I'm thinking and doing as a conscious being somehow miraculously seems to march in step with the biological and the physical orders of my being. Um, and one of the things that's really wonderful about science and technology is they become kind of specs for taking that apart. It becomes a place to see how different ontological orders interact with one another and understand the taking apart and putting together of that um, miraculous coincidence that has 
um, been at the heart of philosophical inquiry for so long. Um, in the metaverse, we see it only more so doubled upon itself. Um, around the concept of ethical choreography, um, we're in a world where we, in fact, as it turns out, juggle all the time all kinds of ethical uh, um, repertoires, if you like, utilitarian and other consequentialist repertoires, deontological ones that tell us what, what's right and what we ought to be doing from first principle, local moral worlds, the norms, our ancestors, things that matter to us from our cultures, social justice, redistributive justice, and fighting against discrimination and harms based upon um, historical and ongoing um, discrimination, human rights, which have been has been such an important um, global lingua franca with its own, own issues as well, and um, concepts around autonomy and freedom that are um, quite, um, that permeate the, the biomedical world, for example. Um, Ethical Choreography is um, a, a book that looks at how science and technology in this era where all science and technology, as I call it in that book, has ethics. We used to think that there was science and facts, and then there were what there was is and ought, and now we live in an era, era where everybody recognizes that every science and technology comes with a package of ethical um, and moral uh, um, connotations um, at every core of its level. Um, I also wanted to draw attention to uh, this concept of triage. You'll see on the, the book front of Good Science, those of you who move in um, uh, international worlds will recognize the international triage tag. Uh, it's the field tag that you, put, uh, that you attach to bodies. Uh, and in this time of uh, war, it feels newly relevant. Um, green means that, that you don't need to be transported to medical care. Uh, yellow is the walking wounded. You can get there slowly. Um, red is if you rush these people to, to um, care, they uh, can probably be saved given the medical care that we have available. And obviously the black is people who are already dead or cannot be saved with uh, what we already have. And the point of, view of developing the method of triage that I developed in this um, book was to say that when we live in an era where we're inundated with data, how, what, what's the right way to focus, or what, what are the kinds of ways of navigating and deciding which data to focus on um, among in that enormous archive, if you like. And one of the things that I um, was urging us to do was to, to navigate um, in regards to the necropolitical and biopolitical. In other words, to navigate in regards to who does this kind of technology and this kind of science make live and help thrive, and who is going to be su subject to uh, premature death, to use uh, Ruthie Gilmore's words. Um, so I just want to give, take us to one more a classical philosophical um, uh, experiment. It's a thought experiment, that, and thought experiments have been with us in the Western philosophical tradition for at least 200 years. Um, and that is to imagine uh, what we could do uh, with, in the vir as regards to an, the ethical positioning potential of virtual reality. Um, I've taken something here that is, um, <laughs> Greg reminded me that this is actually not a, Bru a Bruegel painting, it's a, it's a copy from a later date, um, but it's usually uh, uh, labeled as such, it's usually labeled as a, as a Bruegel um, with the landscape of um, showing Icarus falling, and that's Icarus falling into the water there, you, you'll all, this is one of the most famous paintings that exists, and it's also been um, written about uh, famously in two of the most famous poems, certainly two of the most famous ekphratic poems of all time, um, uh, Auden's poem, uh, Musée des Beaux-Arts, and William Carlos Williams's poem. Um, and these two uh, quotes uh, splash quite unnoticed and turns quite leisurely from the disaster. Both of these poems and this re the reflections on this painting have grounded us in this in the critical theory tradition, the classic question of what happens when one way or another you, you go along as if nothing happened in the face of great disaster and great suffering. What do we do with, how, what, how do we become complicit in atrocity 
and how do we stop ourselves from being complicit in atrocity? And what we get in, in, with this picture is everybody's going about their way. The oxen is going on, the plowman is going on, um, and, and the poems reflecting on this at different eras, and both these eras of Auden and Williams are really resonant for us this month, I think. Um, one right on the brink of the Second World War, and then the other at the height of the Cold War. And so I think in some ways the echoes of those two parts of history are really, really thick for us right now. So I just wanted to invite us all to engage in the thought experiment of, because it's happening everywhere in art museums across the world, that we're being invited in virtually into all kinds of works of art, but we're being invited inside um, work, famous works of art such as this. What happens if you start to imagine that you can be, that any one of these characters, the boat, the ox, the plowman, Icarus himself, and of course Icarus is waxen wings are, are melting onto his body and the feathers are clotting as he gets near to the salty water as he falls into the sea and Daedalus is saying, fly in the middle, fly in the middle. And it's, it, most often we, we equate science and technology with that, the, the danger of arrogance and the danger of, uh, and you know, the need for humility. But in some sense, this is inviting us to take on the, the critical theory thing, which is how might we think differently about the ethical world if we were to be any of these people in the picture. Myself, I wish we didn't use the word avatar. I wish we used Ma Makaria, which, who is the supposed consort of Thanatos of death. Um, so uh, that's, the, that's the, the character I, I, I wish that we could think of. But if, it, if any of these could be our, our Makaria or Makaria, if any of these could be, what would we actually say if we could imagine being one of these people? Would we go on our doggy ways? Or might we turn to one another and not be complicit in um, these atrocities? Not, as they say, it's a very ableist expression, but not turn a blind eye. Um, and my instinct is that the virtual reality, if we, if we take seriously the ethical obligation, um, we would be more likely to say, Hang on, I'm coming to get you. Come fly close to me. Thank you. Wonderful, Karis, thank you. Um, what a moving, moving picture and moving set of words. Um, my name's Morgan Ames. I'll be the moderator today. I'm an assistant professor of practice at the School of Information. Um, it is my great honor to, to introduce our wonderful um, roundtable participants today. Um, if I sang all of their praises, we would, I would not leave a lot of time for them to speak. So in the interest of time, we did print out short bios in this handout. Um, I'm just going to very briefly introduce each of them and then hand things over to our first presenter, Emma. So Emma Frazier, who you will hear from first, is a lecturer in the new media and media, in new media and media studies here at UC Berkeley. Richmond, um, next to Emma, is a postdoctoral researcher at the UC Berkeley Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity. Wade Wallerstein, next to Richmond, is a digital anthropologist and curator for, uh, from the San Francisco Bay Area from here. Um, Don XYZ, or Don Hansen is a designer and internet artist based in Oakland. And um, Edgar Fabian Frias is a non-binary, queer, indigenous, tirarita, Latinx, and brown multidisciplinary artist, curator, educator, and psychotherapist, and a um, current student, MFA student here at UC Berkeley. All right, um, in the interest, again, of time and giving lots of time to these wonderful panelists, I'm going to hand things over. Um, do keep in mind that we will have ample time for questions at the end, so please be thinking as you hear from them what more you would like to hear, what kinds of resonances you hear, possibly with your own experience, and we will get to that in the last half hour or so. Thank you. Hand things over to Emma.
Okay. Okay, so I will also uh, do my best to keep to time. And as such, I will read directly. I apologize, it's not the most interesting thing, but we need to keep this uh, under 10 minutes. The coming metaverse appears to be variously social, virtual, 3D, connected, palpably real, and extravagantly fantastic, both here already and on the horizon. The all-encompassing metaverse is the future of the internet in the form of an intensively connected, populated, centralized, and monetized web. The future of co-working, the future of commerce and trade, of education, travel, gaming. And that's just according to Facebook, who in claiming the word meta announced the beginning of a PR exercise intended to mark out and claim the new territories of a coming virtual realm. The metaverse is suddenly everywhere, which is one of its most beguiling qualities. Like Marc Auger's Non Place or Michel Foucault's Heterotopia, the draw of the metaverse is its capacity to stand as the counter to some authentic sense of being situated in all of the real sites and locations of tangible reality. The slipperiness of the term, its ability to conjure futuristic visions of disembodied avatars roaming free and unanchored, relies on this sense of being unlike the fundamentally unsatisfying here and now. Yet, as many of us here know and also remember, the notion of a multidimensional new realm in the not-too-distant future is far from a recent development. We've heard all of this before. In the cyberspace imagination of the 1990s with the early development of the public internet and VR headsets, we were always just a few years away from a fully virtual world that would sweep us into a new age of non-reality. This 3D new world to be claimed is just one part of the vast territory that the metaverse as both concept and tangible collection of services or platforms occupies. For a company like Twitter, for example, the metaverse presents the opportunity to develop NFT profile pictures and connect to users' crypto wallets. For McDonald's, it means stores in the metaverse where customers can, for some reason, enter and order for physical delivery, for physical delivery of food to their home. For others, sometimes including myself, the metaverse is a catch-all concept so broad as to be barely sensical, almost mystical, a way to claim the future before we've even arrived, a problematic imagining of a new site of conquest, the same new frontier of the early internet. At worst, a means to call into view and actualize a fever dream of harvesting our material realities by presenting a richer alternative world of teleportation, bubbles and holograms that reflect people's living rooms, streets and offices back to the waiting databases of Facebook and Amazon. Yet multiple metaverse imaginaries are already in contention. The metaverse has been imagined, predicted, structured, invested in for decades. I would argue that the metaverse is already here. Consider the dystopian vision in Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash, which is the novel usually credited with inventing the term to describe an immersive space accessed via goggles, where users' physical bodies are inscribed as avatars with optional new skins and identities. Stevenson's 1992 work describes technologies that not only mirror tech billionaires' imaginaries of a future virtual landscape, but many that have been developed since the book was published. For example, a 3D world model a golden ball called Earth, where you can zoom in and out at will on a real-time map of our planet, or a vast database where you can, sorry, a da vast database of global knowledge merged with a surveillance web in a society where information is currency, data generated at any cost to ensure a never-ending stream of content and information that grows not just tech or media monopolies, but knowledge and experience monopolies, a mirror of our contemporary digital, datafied, agglomerated, algorithmic culture but on a larger scale. So this is the current state of the metaverse, both grim and fantastical. And yet, especially if we expand to the spatial and geographical thinking that I'm particularly interested in, part of what is collectively dreamt up here already exists, particularly in the navigable representations and geographies of digital games and game-like environments and their relationship to what we might call real-world space and culture. So I want to discuss two examples based on actual locations and environments and then on social space. The first is the actual but also often reimagined ruins of the Chernobyl exclusion zone in Ukraine and specifically the abandoned city of Pripyat. In 2009, I visited the exclusion zone as part of a research project on ruin photography and tourism. Even at that time, there were video gamers visiting the site due to their interest in the Stalker game series, which is set in the area around the damaged reactor. 
Most of those I met took photographs identical to images already posted online with the intention of uploading them themselves to Flickr and social media. Later that year, the third Stalker game was released, depicting on its cover an image that I had been chasing around the internet for the best part of three years, and which the tourists you can see here were also taking a photo of. The rusted red and yellow Ferris wheel from the never opened amusement park located in Pripyat close to the Chernobyl plant. So this image is probably familiar to many of you. In recent weeks with the Russian invasion of Ukraine and occupation of the exclusion zone, these same images have resurfaced in news media and social media. The developers, a Ukrainian team, have since taken to Twitter to announce delays in an upcoming Stalker reboot, but also to share their experience of the war and gaining significant support online. The game itself has been embroiled in the conflict too, with Russian trolls downvoting it on Steam. And given the game's link to one of the symbolic sites of the conflict, its future completion is now doubly linked to Ukrainian survival in the face of disaster. Through the ruins, uh, through the ruins in the Stalker series, Game players reinscribe themselves on the site, and when war comes to Chernobyl, this shared experience feeds into a sense of connection to something distant from their everyday experience, yet urgent and palpable. While some have dismissed the series as problematic, playing in a disaster zone, obviously, others argue that the realistic depiction of a specific place alongside horror and supernatural themes puts the game in relationship with Tarkovsky's 1979 film of the same name and the science fiction novel Roadside Picnic, on which the film was based. While tech companies rush to advertise their vision of the metaverse as social, connected, and about realistic digital places, what these kinds of games reveal with their real-world histories and sites as digital places and fan bases and communities is, what we are, is that we are already metaversal. The feedback between reality and the virtual, the connection between people, doesn't need to be paternalistically controlled by big tech. The second example that I want to discuss very quickly before finishing up is GatherTown, which launched during COVID. It's a site offering customizable online spaces that are user-generated and managed and navigated using basic avatars. Gather relies on voice communication and proximity of avatars to mediate person-to-person -person -person communication, making it a relational space between bodies as well as between player and place. While not the high definition, indistinguishable reality of metaverse hype, Gather as a self-proclaimed metaverse service is also representative of the way in which digital space and connection are part of current technology already. So what this is, is a screenshot that I've taken with permission from a Berkeley faculty member, Andrew Bray, uh, who built this classroom environment in Gather from scratch during COVID lockdown. Students can visit the instructor's office, they can attend lectures, they can go to their session, session, sections, are all facilitated via proximity-triggered video. I use GatherTown as an example of space that shares many of the same assumptions and narratives of bigger tech companies, but which also importantly works now as a permanent virtual environment because of the way that it builds on pre-existing architectural conventions, fairly basic tech that we already have, and the social and cultural norms of a university. Geographical and social space does not require verisimilitude to successfully exist, function, bring people together and immerse them in a virtual space. So just to finish up, I want to argue that digital spaces and worlds are not on the horizon. What Zuckerberg and co are describing is at least in part the reinvention or takeover of existing social and cultural life through intensified media consumption. But that is not to say, of course, that there's nothing important about metaversal imaginaries. While the predicted new infrastructure of the metaverse, which we could argue in many ways constitutes all that is radically new about the metaverse, will constrain us. These infrastructures will also open up critical possibilities to shape a different future or set of futures, and we'll hear more about this shortly, to adapt both the imagination and the ruination at the heart of technological process into something that builds on rather than blandly reinvents existing social and cultural space and continues to intersect with people and places. I want to conclude by looking at the etymology of the term metaverse, which gives us an unexpected insight into the possibilities of an other reality. Verse as in universe, omniverse, transverse, pluriverse, all sharing the Latin root vetere, to turn, a word which in itself has metaversal connotations evolving from a description of the plough furrow making a line in the soil, to the usage describing making a mark on a page, then to a line of writing. Turning the plough, a material intervention, became making a line, then writing a verse. The verse makes the world. On to meta. In Greek, it links to the notion of after or beyond, the pursuit of something higher. But we can add to this, in German as in Old English, meta is also the source for mit or mid, as in with, 
but also notions of betwixt or between. Not just the pursuit of a higher quality experience as the hype would have it, the metaverse, we would say, is both the in-between, mediating user, system, community, imaginary, but also beyond the line, taking us from physical reality to creativity and onto the realm of cultural and spatial production and imagination. This is both the present and the future of the metaverse, not just we, as we imagine it, but as we currently live, within, between and beyond human culture, technology, data, digital space, contestation, connectedness and materiality. Thank you. Oh, hi everyone. Let's see, my name is Richmond and um, I'm also gonna talk from some notes to try to keep myself to time. Um, so part of what I study is the social aspects of the production of technologies and that includes how different groups imagine the future of technologies and how we can reflect on those types of futures and think about the types of worlds that we wanna create or the types that we want to avoid. And today I wanna think about um, how Facebook, or Meta now, might um, be imagining the future of virtual reality and augmented reality, and kind of analyze that in light of some past companies' speculative imaginations and imaginaries of these types of technologies. So in our time together, I'm gonna try to make three points. Um, one, imagined futures come from specific places and points of view. These uh, imagined futures matter and we can also question those imagined futures and try to create some alternate ones. And so today I'm gonna to focus on a set of artifacts that we call concept videos or vision videos. So these videos are often made by companies and depict short stories or scenarios about possible technical futures. And these videos are not necessarily predictive, right? but they're indicative of the types of futures that these companies might want to work towards. And so some of us may have seen clips from a concept video published by Facebook last year about the metaverse. Um, and when I saw that video, it immediately reminded me of two prior videos from the past 30 years uh, made by AT&T and Google. So we're gonna try to pull it up and hopefully this works. Um, we're gonna try to watch some brief clips from all three of these videos. So this is the first one, which is the Facebook one from uh, fall last year. All right, perfect. <laughs> oh, hey, Mark. Hey, what's going on? Hey, Hi. Hi, Mark. What's up, Mark? Hey, should we deal you in? Hey. Sorry, I'm running late, but you've got to see what we're checking out. There's an artist going around Soho hiding AR pieces for people to find. 3D street art? That's cool. Send that link over so we can all look at it. This is stunning. Okay, that is something. That's awesome. Wow. wow. I love the movement. Wait, it's it's disappearing. This is amazing. Hold on. I'll tip the artist and they'll extend it. Wow. Brilliant. Okay. And so um, this next one is from a video from 1993 that AT&T is thinking about what's technology in the 21st century like. System, whole heroes and horrors. Zach, you can't quit just when I'm about to bite your neck. It's worth 500 points. I got a message. I gotta put you guys on hold. Network calls on hold. System, message please. Zach, if this message appears, you've spent more than an hour playing a game, and you know the limits we agreed on, sweetie. So finish up right away, and if you wanna stay on the system, then switch to virtual homework, okay? Release hold on calls. Mommy checking up on you, Zachary? Kara, I'm gonna clobber you. Okay, and then the third one is the uh, Google Glass video from 2012, and this was released hey, just before the actual technology was. Cool. Good to see you again. Thanks, man. Take a photo of this. Share it to my circles. So this guy's like walking around New York City. Music, stop. Hi, what's up? Hey. Hey. And then they have this kind of virtual date at the end and the music stops. He plays the ukulele for her and it's the same music that's been playing the whole commercial. When I hear that song, that's the only thing I think about is that Google thing now. Um, but these three videos, next slide, there we go. Uh, these three videos represent different imagined futures around augmented reality and virtual reality. 
And you know, I think it also points to that you know, this idea of virtual reality is not new. People have been thinking about this for a long time. And so the first point I want to reflect on is that these imagined futures come from specific places and points of view, right? Like literally, they come from these corporations, AT&T, Meta, and Google. But we can also look at these and ask questions like, what are the social values and ethical implications of these imagined futures? Who benefits or stands to gain from these versions of the future, and who might be harmed or left out? I think it's really interesting that all these three videos depict a first-person point of view to introduce the viewer to virtual reality or augmented reality. And all of them are viewpoints from young white men as this viewpoint that we're supposed to empathize with. And the way these imagined futures are depicted are centered on ways that these young white male bodies move through space, whether that's virtual space or the physical space of like New York City in the Google Glass video, which is like a different way of moving through space than how other people and other bodies move. And this leads me to ask questions like, who are these technologies built for in these imagined futures, and who gets left out? And we can also ask questions like, what does sociality look like? Um, right? So interestingly, also, like video telephony is a big thing in all of these three visions of the future, which is like an interesting way of communicating. It seems kind of, uh, you know, I don't know, basic of that. I don't know. It's uh, interesting that it shows up in all of them. Um, right? Or quite, we can ask questions like, what does ownership of media look like? What is, where does money and capital come into play in these futures? These imagined futures in the video are also bound to the cultural values and institutions of the time when they're created. So in the 93 AT&T video, the, the boy who's using the virtual reality headset is part of a uh, stereotypical nuclear family in the US. There's a white presenting father, mother, and daughter as well. In another part of the video, there's a storyline about the daughter who's getting married. She uses a public video phone booth um, from AT&T in order to introduce her fiance to her parents. And so, you know, this is a way of imagining the future of computing and communication that centers AT&T, right? And so I think it's clear that, you know, technology, social norms, um, cultural practices have developed in ways that are different than this AT&T vision of the future. Um, so I think that means when we're looking at meta now, you know, virtual reality may take off in new forms, but I suspect in practice it will look very different from what meta Facebook's version of it is. So at the same time, right, if these particular imagined futures might not necessarily come true, these imagined futures still matter because companies' imagined futures have the ability to set the terms of discourse and debate, whether in how media sources talk about technologies or the types of issues that regulators become attentive to. It also shifts how real life resources are distributed in the present. So already we see lots of resources and work hours from a range of companies that are racing to work on developing new virtual reality experiences and there are growing research resources that are being uh, directed in ways that might help enact kind of Meta's vision. And so these imagined futures matter for the things that we care about in the present. But I think as I've tried to illustrate, these imagined futures that are put forth by large corporations might not work for everyone. And I think the kind of hopeful takeaway is that we can question these imagined futures, particularly those from large companies, and work to create alternate ones. So in some prior research I've done, I've studied how um, the public press related to Google Glass when it was first announced, and there was kind of a split between folks who took that feature from Google at face value and imagined that's how things would play out. And then there was another group of people who suggested that you know, augmented reality technologies might develop in different ways than what Google imagined. And so one of my favorite alternatives is this parody video by YouTuber Tom Scott who depicted Google Glass with kind of pop-up ads as you're walking around and then sharing data with the police without user consent. And there are lots of folks who can um, help us reimagine these futures. Artists, designers, researchers, and creators can try to create different types of virtual experiences. We're going to see some of that today. Um, something close to my research, I think technology workers who work at these large tech companies can also play a role within product teams and development teams by just raising the simple question of, for whom and with whom are we developing virtual reality technologies and can we expand our ideas of who might be using this and who might be affected? And then, you know, policymakers and regulators might also be able to do some work to kind of set the terms of debate and make sure that there's room for multiple versions of virtual reality. And so I just want to kind of leave us with this. Um, because imagined futures suggest 
social values or arrangements of power and resources. I think this means that when we talk about the metaverse, we should be cognizant about what types of futures we're referring to when we use that word. And if we're taking for granted the meta Facebook version of the metaverse, or if we might try to reimagine the metaverse otherwise. So thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Don Hansen. As a artist, I go by the name Don XYZ because I'm an internet artist and Don XYZ is my domain name. Because I make a lot of internet art and websites as artworks, I wanted to choose a name that links my work closely to my identity and when I say my name, you can immediately go and find my work. Um, also as a bonus, when people put my name in like a newsletter or something, it automatically becomes a link. Um, so, as a digital artist, for a long time, I have always been thinking about how do you exhibit digital art? How do you exhibit screen-based artwork? And we have some strategies that are kind of well-known. You can put a screen in a gallery, you can put a projector in a gallery, um, computers, that all works, but why is that all we have? How, how can we better display digital artworks? Um, and this sort of research direction for me became my work now that I do with New Art City, and my direction kind of got swept up in what is now known as the metaverse, or this direction of art online and 3D spaces. Um, so yeah, that's, that's why I'm here, and I wanna talk a little bit about how that happened and what's happening. Um, that's just a screenshot of my website. That's, that's all my stuff. Um, so New Art City. So when I was um, doing my MFA degree two years ago, and so think about what happened two years ago. This was before NFTs kind of blew up. This was before the marketing machine of Meta and the Metaverse started doing its thing. Um, I was studying and trying to figure out how to display digital artworks, better ways of displaying digital artworks. And of course, as an internet artist, my thought is, okay, maybe this can be something that is online. Maybe instead of experiencing digital art in a gallery on a wall, digital art is meant to be experienced digitally. And what does it mean to experience things digitally? So this was also around the time like the 3D web was starting to come into its own. Um, WebGL is now like deeply integrated in the web browser you can do it on mobile phones even. And with the maturity of this sort of technology, all sorts of little like 3D web experiment, experiments started to pop up. And I was kind of fluent in JavaScript and 3JS is the, the, the um, framework that I used. And so what happened was as soon as kind of all of the classes went to online mode, all of the galleries on campus closed down Everybody was looking for a solution. How do we show our digital art? How do we show our regular art? And that's kind of when my research practice kind of kicked in to like, okay, I can make a prototype and make a virtual art gallery. Because of course there, are, there have been virtual art galleries for a long time, but none of them were really capturing the feeling of being together. One of my favorite parts about going to an art exhibition is going there and seeing friends, having conversations, talking to, exp talking to people, experiencing art together and having a co-present experience. So that was my design goal for New Art City initially. Just allow people to upload art, arrange it in 3D, and have an exhibition together. Um, I really like that Richmond was showing all of those kind of corporate marketing videos of what people imagine the metaverse to be because um, I, made, I made one too. <laughs> New Art City is a toolkit and community for online exhibitions. Every show is a 3D multiplayer environment designed and built using our online drag and drop editor. Visitors can see each other and chat while exploring the exhibitions. Popular shows can support hundreds of visitors at the same time from all over the world. And you can access shows on any desktop or mobile device in your web browser 
without registering, downloading, or configuring anything. Artists using our toolkit have built installations that range from pragmatic to wildly imaginative, and you can install alone or together with your team in real time. New Art City gives all artwork a global stage, which transforms traditional art and offers a new native format for digital art. We are an artist-run organization, and we are dedicated to supporting artists in everything we do, especially those who face barriers in the traditional fine art world. That's why we provide virtual space to those who are denied physical space, and why we promote and amplify work by queer artists and artists of color. We are building a system which empowers artists to realize the impossible and dream a new type of art. So, this video was produced about a year ago, and, okay, since then, we've, we've achieved a few things. Um, and let me tell you exactly what New Art City has become. Of course, it's a collaborative 3D website builder that any artist can use, and it's a growing community of people who help each other around this tool. And community is incredibly important because no artist can work alone. I was just talking with Edgar about this exact, exact subject because we all need each other to lift each other up, and community is one of the most important aspects of art. And it's a way for artists, galleries, museums, and universities to reach a global audience. So since we started, we've launched 100, over 100 public exhibitions. Those are all on the website. You can explore the homepage and visit any of those shows. They stay open for a very long time. Over 160,000 visitors from all over the world. Over 2,500 individual artists have shown work. And we've done several commissions and we're in the middle of our second residency and we are aiming for 20% of our revenue to go directly back to artists in the form of commissions and residency fees. Um, so I'm just gonna play this one and, and talk over it. Um, actually, maybe that's it, maybe I'm just done. <laughs> I'm just gonna leave. I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, yeah, feel free to talk to me more about this um, anytime. If you're an artist, digital artist, internet artist, or somebody who wants to show work online, um, happy to explore this subject and, and give people free space to work in. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Wade. I'm the associate curator at Gray Area in San Francisco. I'm also the founder um, and director of uh, Silicon Valley, which is an online exhibition platform. Um, and I also work for Transfer Gallery, uh, which is a gallery devoted to computational and simulation art. We've been around since 2013, working with digitally editioned artwork. Um, but at my core, I'm an anthropologist, um, and in my research, I study virtual worlds. And really similarly to Emma, I'm really interested in the relationship between virtual spaces and offline spaces and the way that our time spent in interfaces with technology and inside of simulated environments affects our cognition and affects the way that we move through the world. Um, this is an image from an ongoing series of mine. It's called Virtual Phenomenology. And in each of these works, I try to capture a really specific moment during my ethnographic research uh, uh, inside of different virtual environments. This comes from a user-generated world in VR chat. Um, there's you know, so many more that I could show you. I have, uh, I have gigabytes and gigabytes and gigabytes of field note recordings uh, from different spaces that I've spent time in. Um, and I, over the past, and, but this is all, this, this exploration and this study is really rooted in this idea of phenomenology, which um, I kind of take from anthropologist Chris Tilley's uh, 1994 book, A Phenomenology of Landscape. Um, I studied under him at UCL in London, um, and what he really wanted to impart was the importance of phenomenology as a research uh, framework or praxis that uh, facilitates deeper understanding and meaning um, of our, the relationship between being and being in the world. Um, and that's something that through these uh, different modes of ethnographic research and virtual space, I try to capture so that we can really understand what it means to be in the metaverse, how it feels to be there, and how that then 
changes us on an internal and on an ex external sociological level. Um, through my curatorial practice um, and through my various uh, ex uh, curatorial uh, outputs, different exhibitions, shows, um, and uh, what have you in the metaverse, I really try to, uh, in line with what Don was speaking about earlier, create native experiences inside of virtual spaces. Um, this is an exhibition that I curated uh, just this past fall as part of the Great Area Festival 2021. It was called Worlding Protocol, and we asked each of the artists who came to build a space that served as a diorama for a larger world. We understood the constraints of the virtual space. This show was actually built inside of New Art City. Um, I'm an early user of New Art City. I think uh, Silic uh, I curated one of the first shows on the platform, um, and I've been really excited about using that space and kind of having my own agency as a curator and as an arts organiz organizer to uh, give artists and develop projects that feel really native to online environments. I think that there's a lot of talk about how the online is not real or the online doesn't feel as true or native for a lot of different kinds of artwork. Um, and I really wanted to push back, push back against that um, in my practice and create really unique experiences that only operate um, online. And I think that in this exhibition, uh, specifically Worlding Protocol, I asked all of the artists to think about what it meant to them to build a world and what it meant to occupy space in the metaverse. Um, I think that in the midst of Meta and other and Vive Arts and other corporations trying to um, create, that's a, the one in the upper right corner, that's a, a scene created by a New York based artist, Jeremy Cuillard. Um, and in the idea here was that we need to come up with a different kind of protocol. Um, we have technology, we have interfaces, we have software, we have human connections, and all of them kind of work. Uh, within frameworks that are limiting in some way or other. Um, and somehow we need to think of a way to come together, all together, and create a new kind of world online that works for everyone. But then you have NFTs kind of thrown into the mix and you have this kind of really crazy situation of uh, speculative financial capital and uh, ownership becoming part of something that was originally intended to be utopian and free online. This is just a, a looping video of a show that I created for Transfer Gallery. It's called Pieces of Me. Um, and in the exhibition, we created a, a kind of uh, a really simple, really web 2.0 experience where people can purchase different NFT artworks sold by the Ethereum blockchain um, that take a critical stance on the current conditions of the marketplace. Um, this is just another example of uh, how I've tried to, through my work, understand the complexities of overlapping systems. Um, currently we have an old art world and a new art world kind of smushed together and all of it's falling under the moniker of the metaverse, of, <laughs> the, of, the, virtual, of the virtual world. And somehow we have to reconcile all of this difference. I wanted to share this, so in my answer to this, my, 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 my experiment is that we need to listen to the voices of curatorial agency uh, online. This is a solo show by Adrian Pijoan. I just launched a new exhibition program through uh, my, online my online gallery, Silicon Valley, where we invite one artist at a time to create solo exhibitions in New Art City. Um, in the current contemporary NFT marketplace and environment, artworks are placed in a grid space. They're in, algorithmic, they're in an algorithmic feed that uh, it's not transparent or opaque to the user, how to navigate it, how to create context, and works get lost. And what I wanted to do was, in partnership with New Art City, who really graciously provided space for us, was create um, uh, a program where curatorial voice would translate into direct action and dollar value sales for artists in a way that was true to the decentralized nature of how these systems can operate. Um, right now we see artists flocking to just a small number of uh, startup uh, websites to steward all of their artwork and creative practice. And this felt like a step forward in helping uh, develop a program for artists that reclaims agency back from those spaces. If you're some more uh, stills from the show, you can check it out. It's online right now at newart.city. 
Um, and all of the works that you see in the show uh, inside this beautiful uh, uh, alien space that the artist has created are also available for purchases and as NFTs by the artist uh, through the artist's uh, own page. Silicon Valley takes no profit from any of the sales. Finally, as I close out, I know I'm touching on a lot of different things here, but I think that in the context of uh, the term metaverse, there's a, lot to, there's a lot to consider. And I've been really inspired by the work of, of avatar artist Le Turbo Abaddon, who only uh, is identifiable by their screen name and by their virtual representations. And they, over the past few months, have uh, been developing a concept called EXO. EXO, um, are de EXO is decentralized simulations that firmly reject the corporate metaverse. Right now, the way the metaverse is experienced by most people is a mass-produced, mass-market product um, where the code and all of the assets are housed in a very centralized way. Uh, the kinds of projects and the kind of future that I'm looking towards is one where protocols for curatorial uh, outputs for artistic labor and for world creation are truly decentralized, a protocol that is distributed and not controllable by one corporate uh, entity. Uh, I think I'm just about out of time. Thanks so much. <laughs> Hello everyone, I am, again, my name is Edgar Fabian Frias, and I am a visual artist, I'm a contemporary artist who, for the most part, has done a lot of my work within the contemporary art realm. I am pretty new to the NFT space, I've only been in, well, I guess that's relative, because I, I guess I'm pretty old now in the NFT space relative to other folks, but um, I've worked in the digital realm for a really long time, and this is an example of me kind of physicalizing and bringing some of my digital work into the physical space. This was installed last weekend at the Institute of Contemporary Art in San Francisco. It is a Nyerika, which is a sacred map of the um, indigenous community that I'm a part of, the Virarica people and it is used for divination, for oracular purposes. And so I also connect a lot with spirituality in my work, and my work is very personal. It is really connected to my own sense of self, the people that I'm connected with. This is a performance that I did at Southern Exposure in San Francisco a few months ago, and I showed a work of mine that had been defaced, and um, I ended up creating like a ritual for my ancestors because that was the original intention of the work and also projected some images of myself on the wall. And last year, I was a part of a show called Techno Intimacy that happened in Florida at Mocha Jacksonville. And it kind of shows you a little bit of like the different realms that I connect with, performance, video art, photo, collage, uh, and also physicalizing some of these pieces into fabric, into rugs and pillows. I also connect a lot with plants in my work and definitely connect a lot with interspecies communication and animism, uh, which are big parts of my own um, practice and also parts of the communities that I, I'm connected with as well. And a lot of my work has been relational. Uh, I am also a psychotherapist too and an educator, and I host a lot of workshops, ceremonies, public events, and of course, um, with the pandemic, a lot of these um, events have gone on the internet and have also um, you know, had to morph and transform in different ways. And I, ha along with many other people, have spent a lot more time kind of showing my work online and finding ways to really disseminate my vision and my practices on the internet. And so before I got involved in the NFT space, I was definitely creating a lot of digital work online. This is a screenshot that I took yesterday of my Giphy account. I am known as Mutant Magic on Giphy, and my GIFs have over 260 million views. And I just wanted to show you a couple of examples of some of the GIFs that I create. They are from like repurposed, found, or stolen images online. I also connect, combine them with images that I make myself or take myself. 
really trying to dissolve that hierarchy between like found and created, stolen, replicated, um, and really working with aesthetics that are queer, that are trans, that are also uh, connected to my own indigenous ancestry, connect to connections to colors and uh, different symbols that I bring into my work. And it was my friend Sarah Zucker, who I'm so grateful for, who uh, is now known as one of the OG crypto artists in the space, who really kind of pushed me to move into selling more of my uh, digital art as NFTs. Uh, Sarah and I have collaborated on different projects. This is one project that we did in 2018 called Vision Vision. And you know, we've kind of seen it almost like as a, an oracular statement as to kind of where we are now. And uh, we've definitely c connected a lot with performance and play and channeling. And I think those are all really um, elements that I still bring into my practice as well. And so the first NFT that I ever minted was uh, an evolution in my own practice. I call it Mutant Key to the Post-Internet. It was my first work that I ever created that was kind of working with coding along with some of the collage work that I've done. And I saw this as a way for me to really kind of uh, demarcate like a moment, a switch in my career and also really start to ask that question of what does it mean to be on the internet? What does it mean to share my work? Especially because I've been sharing a lot of my work on Instagram or on different social media platforms for free. And so part of my practice has now been to kind of reclaim some of these works that I've released for free, tra retranslate them again, and start to sell them as NFTs. And, and uh, a lot of these are now getting collected by people. And I've definitely noticed the way, as we've been talking about, different social media companies have been really responding to the way that artists have been getting um, empowered to really sell their own work, have more agency over their own artwork, and um, are definitely starting to offer money to people and try trying to get them to stay on their platforms and keep creating content for their platforms. And so this is, I think, the third piece that I ever released on, um, I think this was on Rarible. I've uh, released my work on the Ethereum and the Tezos blockchain. And again, there's performance. There's also um, me experimenting. And I think that's one thing that's been really exciting about being in the NFT space is I've been able to both go look at my archive and kind of reimagine my archive, reimagine my digital artwork, and also kind of experiment and play and create other forms of art and really uh, kind of take on the, take on the um, ethos that I've noticed with the other people I've been connecting with in the space who are also experimenting, trying out new things, trying out new processes, seeing how folks respond to it. And this is the first work that I ever minted that was from a gallery uh, that I've shown uh, in New York. And so this uh, existed as a postcard at some point, but now exists on the Tezos platform on Object or Tea or Hicket Nunk. It um, has different names, but this is really a way for me to kind of explain. Um, I'll explain the name, the Kie de Ya is kind of playing on this uh, phrase that is said a lot in Latinx communities, que no soy de aquí ni de allá, which means I'm not from here or there. But I'm kind of playing with that and saying I'm from here and from there, and really kind of naming that my work traverses many spaces, uh, from institutional spaces to underground DIY spaces, and now really moving into the internet and the metaverse in different ways. And I wanted just to share a couple of exhibitions I've been a part of in the metaverse. Uh, most recently, I was in a show with Playboy and Sevens Grant. It was a show on sexuality and gender. And for this project, I created a music video called Mutant Fire. And it's a way of me kind of sharing about my own sexual and gender euphoric visions of myself. And I'm really proud to say this was collected by another really uh, big name in the metaverse named um, Matt Kane, who um, has been really supportive of my practice as well. And they're one of the people that really rallied to make sure that artists in the Web3 metaverse space get play paid um, royalties whenever their work is sold. And I was also a part of an exhibition called Transcendence that took place on a maker's place and was curated by a friend of mine called Kate the Cursed. And it was trans, non-binary, and queer artists sharing their work. And um, I created a piece called Dive In. And I'm really uh, grateful to say that this piece was collected by a really good friend of mine who it was her first, uh, sorry, their first uh, ever uh, piece that they collected. And so also I feel like in the relational way, I've been inviting people into this space. 
And most recently, I've also created my own contract. This is my first ever contract that I've ever made. Uh, and for this work, I am um, releasing kind of longer videos that uh, I am now really excited to have up available to be collected. These are videos that were a part of um, an actual like web series. And so they're in two parts. And um, the last thing I wanted to share is that I've been really connected to a lot of people. Like we've been talking about the metaverse is a very global space. I collaborated with a Nigerian queer artist to create this work, and they're using the money to support queer and trans people in Nigeria. And I'm also really grateful to be connected to Agenda Dao and also the QMODA, the Queer Museum of Digital Art, which are two uh, queer and trans um, organizations that are really looking to uplift, collect, archive, and support queer and trans artists in the space. And last, um, being Vidarika, I was also really excited to see that there's some artists creating artwork to support Vidarika communities in Mexico and this community uh, that they're supporting, they're building infrastructure to support some of the local people in Mexico to get on the blockchain and also to get on, even on the internet, which is something they didn't have access to before. And I think that's it. Thank you. All right. Wow. Thank you all so much for sharing your work, your visions. I feel like there's a lot to unpack here. Um, I want to start opening things up. So if you feel like you have a question, you have um, something you'd like to, to share, some resonance maybe between these, I'd like you to uh, raise your hand. We have some um, ushers who will bring microphones around. Um, just to start, though, I want to share a few of my own reflections about some of the really interesting tensions and convergences I see. I certainly saw a lot of tensions come up in all of your presentations, right? We have, whether it's utopia and dystopia, um, whether it's frontiers and colonialism, I find that word that's used often very, very telling, um, or digital nativity, right? Digital natives, I think that's also very telling, but indigeneity and what that means in the digital space, exclusivity and inclusivity, I think is a thread throughout all of your work. Seeing or touching and feeling is another. Commodification or maybe democratization. Determinism or agency, ownership, stewardship, logics of control versus practices of care. And of course, I want to also deconstruct these binaries that I'm setting up. <laughs> these, are, um, these are clearly problematic in many ways. I would say the convergences that you've all outlined, though, are, are unsettled, as uh, to borrow a term that uh, the Emma used, right? Um, they're heterotopias. They are um, intersections, intersectionalities, um, queer identities and spaces. Um, they are, uh, to borrow a term from my own home field, socio-technical, right? They're, they're the deep intermixing of the social and the technical such that we can never really distinguish. It is not one or the other, it is both. So I'd love to, um, if we do have any audience questions, I'd love to hear from, from all of you as well. But uh, if we don't yet, um, I'd love to let you all respond a little bit if, if you want to, to one another. Is there? OK, let's. let's uh, I, okay, okay, it works, <laughs> great. So listening to all of your presentations, I took one class of film and media theory last semester, so. I'm not an now, but I'm <laughs> Hello? Okay, so I find myself thinking a lot about like the essays of the different authors that I've read, especially 24-7 um, by Jonathan Crary, where he kind of describes the 24-7 nonstop condition of time now, where technology is kind of implicated in the kind of expansion of time, where nobody can envision like a future beyond what is in front of them, and where time is expanded to create more space for consumerism. Do you feel that this is like a danger of the metaverse future and like a likely possibility that this 24-7 condition of time will continue?
Yeah, I, I definitely have heard people talk about this. I think it's um, something really important to name that um, uh, both I've heard people share that like in terms of accessibility, there are people who are really grateful for that 24 seven like availability. Uh, there are folks who because of different illnesses or, or needs that they uh, feel more included because they're able to go online whenever they have energy or whenever they're able to actually like go and connect with people or sell their work. And also I definitely have noticed a lot of burnout. <laughs> I've noticed a lot of people needing to take time away. And so people made me themselves creating boundaries around what is an incessant flow of information and exchange that happens. Um, I think a lot about uh, Christian Markley's The Clock uh, when in thinking about this. It's a, it's a film piece where he created a 24-hour film where every minute uh, there is a scene from a different TV show or movie or commercial where you see a clock uh, 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 set at the time that it currently is when you're watching the film. Um, and I think about that a lot, uh, especially when it's like 4 a.m. and I can't sleep and I'm like selling NFTs and talking to people on Twitter and like just absolutely can't. Um, and I don't know, there's something really expansive in the idea of a 24. I mean, I'm just a total optimist. I'm always a glass half full. And I feel like there's something really exciting and hopeful about the idea of a 24 hour, a 24 seven clock where I can access things that I need and resources whenever I need them. And, you know, as, uh, as Edgar was saying, people with different levels of accessibility to different things. Um, but I also think that in line with a lot of the things that I'm trying to do curatorially, there's a lot, I think that what Edgar said about setting boundaries is really important. Personal boundaries, um, curatorial boundaries. I found that like, you know, a lot of times work is uh, blasted out into the metaverse without a lot of care or consideration for where it's going or how it got there or how it's gonna stay there. Um, and we need to be able to set these kinds of boundaries in virtual space the same way we set them in physical space. I'll, I'll um, quickly take that up as well. I'm quite familiar with that query piece and Curry's other work as well. And part of that is also this question of how do we actually decide what time is and what time looks like? So I am actually of the belief that there isn't really any such thing as time in the sense that really we're all located in, in space, in fact, and it's where you are that dictates where you are in time as well, right? And one of the reasons why we have such a difficulty in with this problem of, you know, constant, everything's on, there's constant consumption, there's constant digital sort of um, orientation that we can access all of the time is that we don't then know where we are in space, right? This is why we have this whole concept of the virtual, the whole kind of fight over does digital space exist or not, that in fact is sometimes even a generational kind of question. I think it's partly because we're so fixed on this idea of time. And something that I would also bring into that conversation then is that uh, the, the media theorist as well, Walter Benjamin, talks about time as something that is always open to constant future colonization in the sense of, uh, homogenous empty time that is then to be taken up by whoever can plan the future first and this is I think why we're so obsessed in a sense with the temporal dimension and I, I would always bring that back to in fact it's where are you now in space rather than where are we going constantly stressed out about where are we going in time I think I just like to the discussion of time and boundaries makes me think of um, two researchers one Melissa Gregg who talks about like the time boundaries between kind of work and life and a lot of that work is kind of you know earlier like emails and mobile phones but this switch of like being on 24 7 right and like for whom is that kind of always on um benefiting right and i think the you know does it benefit a large corporation or is it benefiting like a local community of care i think is a very different thing and then um sarah sharma talks about um the power of time and like some people have the power to be able to draw those boundaries and others don't. And so I think it's always useful to think about, you know, who gets the ability to make those types of decisions. Yeah. And related to the like 24 hour cycle, if you talk to anybody who works in crypto or who like trades crypto, they will tell you that it never stops. You'll go to bed, you'll wake up, everything has changed. And a lot of the crypto stuff is kind of analogous to what was the stock market, which is a stock market. And where are the incentives? The incentives in a lot of these cases are to make money. And there's a reason that the stock market is only open from morning to afternoon. So people can get a, get a break. 
um, if there's always an opportunity to be making money, things are just going to be moving faster and faster. And that's what we see happening, like this 24-hour cycle across the globe with everything accelerating. And I think this is just kind of a common problem and characteristic of reality in general. As the world gets more people and everybody is connected deeper and working more, things are just going to be faster. And that's something that we have to cope with and create our own strategy, strategies around how do we want to use our time um, and where do we set our boundaries. And I think that something that plays a really big role in that too is globalization. Um, and your, and even you can even think about the splinter net or different internets coming together. I've recently done, started a number of, uh, I've started become, being a discord, uh, manager for a couple different NFT projects. And it's 24 seven because there's people in every single time zone who are in this group wanting to have information at different times. And I feel really bad. There are people just waking up in Beijing all the time who there's a really huge Chinese contingent in this one group that I'm in. And, um, you know, they wake up in the morning, which, which is like my time to go to bed and, uh, they want information and it feels really crappy when I have to, you know, let them go their whole day without, you know, knowing if they won a prize or whatever, you know, thing is going on in that community at that time. And so it does kind of become a situation of care. You run the clock 24 seven so that everybody feels included and that's amazing, but it's super draining too. And from can you hear me? Is it on? Okay. I'll take my mask. How do we reconcile NFTs with their environmental consequences? And also a second part to the question, is it exclusionary to impose artificial scarcity on digital objects? I can answer the first question. Um, I think that... Uh, the way I think that environmental concerns about the t technology related to NFTs are very contemporary. I think that in three years from now, we won't be having those conversations because most operations will have moved to proof of stake chains, which have um, a, a fraction of a fraction of a cost of the, of, of the environmental concern. I think that something that's more more important to talk about is critical mineral resources and the chips that are in our computers. In order for you to type that question, um, people had to go down into a mine and uh, lug out crazy, dangerous uh, minerals, transport them, build them in a factory, and the environmental consequence of just using these devices in the first place uh, is, mu is a much bigger one. I think that NFTs actually, um, you know, I don't think they actually have a huge uh, footprint in comparison. Um, in terms of the, that's actually a weird, I didn't mean to, for it to come across <laughs> that way. That's not really how I meant to, meant to say that. Um, but I think that in terms of imposing artificial scarcity on digital assets, um, that's a really good question. And that's a, that's a moral question that, uh, I think that the world needs to think about a little bit. Um, people, I don't know if people are I don't know. I don't know if that's a positive thing at all. I do know that artists are making money, and I know that that's great, and they're able to have agency over their virtual outputs. But um, I don't know if I necessarily agree that it's a positive thing that uh, NFTs are creating that kind of scarcity. I will say though, at the same time, in ninety percent of NFT cases, the artwork, the digital file, is pinned to IPFS, and as a result of that pinning, the work becomes free and publicly available to anyone on the internet uh, who can search for that uh, token hash. So in a way, minting an NFT also ensures its public availability at the same time as it uh, enforces its scarcity. So there's a little bit of a, a tension there. Uh, and um, I definitely want to um, speak to that too, where I feel like um, as an artist, before I really had the idea that um, my digital assets were not really valuable because in like uh, contemporary you know, museum settings, institutional settings, a lot of times your digital assets are only valuable if they're connected to like a certain like USB or a certain like limited edition um, element that is physical. And so uh, to be able to like mint my work online has actually made me start to value my work more. And I think uh, one analogy that I've seen is that, you know, for example, there's one original Mona Lisa painting and in the same way, you know, an NFT can kind of, you know, be 
uh, similar to that idea. There's an original or maybe an, a few editions of these uh, quote unquote original, but everyone can take a photo. There are millions of photos of the Mona Lisa in the similar way as Wade was saying, the NFT is available publicly to be seen. On the other hand, in a lot of artistic cases, like for example, in different um, ways that artwork is valued, it's valued as long as it's not seen or if it's held within certain spaces. Like for example, there are a lot of off shore like um, warehouses where a lot of artwork is contained and everyone only has access to the photo of it maybe or maybe it's a, on a database but uh, there is a lot of value at this moment in the contemporary art world with artwork being like hidden away or like not seen in the public so this kind of like changes that and allows a lot more people to have access to artwork while also giving um, artists support for what they're doing um, and I also want to add that um, it's also made me shift my relationship with social media because I feel like a lot of artists were making um, a lot of money for social media companies by um, having their artwork only exist on social media and so um, in some ways it's very exploitative for artists to kind of be expected to make artwork for free while other people are really benefiting from that. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? I was actually just going to add something to the previous conversation, but I'll just say it really quickly, thinking about um, Latvian sociologist Liana Ossolina's work, the backside of 24-7 is all those people who live life in waiting, with slowed down, in dispossession, with no temporality in their own control at all. And, um, and it's, not, it's not the slow of Berkeley slow food. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a, a nice thing at all. It's, a, it's a, 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 you know, part of the same uh, neoliberalism that creates, that creates the 24-7. So it was relating to a, a previous conversation. It's on, it's on, it's on. <laughs> ah. Let to take this off. Thank you all. My my question comment <laughs> had to do also a lot with the question of environmental repercussions, and not so much about F NFTs as you were mentioning, but in general, right? The environmental impact of any digital technology so vast, infrastructurally wise, device wise, the internet is so so polluting, and we never really consider it because it enforces the division between the virtual not being physical, right? The sleeker interface becomes invisible because immersive, you forget about the bodies that are being burned, destroyed, unregulated, the trees burning, right, in the Bay Area. So I wonder about this relationship between time constantly, constantly being, being, being in a space that is limited, that is going to end, <laughs> that we're ending and how can we think about that in this new metaverses that we're creating right maybe we need to become more physical uh and force the body somehow the space we're in or we're just gonna die right so how, how do we uh combine this so we don't just create this random metaverse of flying i think in that zuckerberg video they're like uh, red fishes, right? And it's like, well, think of the real forest, buddy. But so, so that kind of thing. Thank you. I, I would straight away um, res respond to that with another kind of question, which is, uh, and maybe this is something that we can all kind of consider, uh, the discourses that we have inherited of virtuality and digitality are very invested in the necessity of it being something less real and less impactful. Uh, and there's a whole range of reasons why that maintains a status quo and a particular power balance. So my kind of question would be, you know, is it not convenient to kind of suggest that we're all gonna take off into the metaverse just when we're starting to really get to terms on it in a big kind of way with all of the inequalities of the material, it's like, mm, why don't we just jet off to some other place where we can control everything and ignore everything else that's going on? So that would be kind of my thing to, to bounce back to all of us. Uh, I think that the idea of hyper-reality is really useful here um, because I think that in a lot of ways in our society, um, it's hard to tell the difference between reality and an illusion. Um, and that's not necessary. And the, the difference is starting to lose meaning in a lot of ways. There's a really great documentary by Adam Curtis. I don't necessarily agree with all of his ideas. It's called hyper-normalization. And he kind of talks about the process by which that kind of disillusionment and cognitive dissonance happens. Um, 
And I think that it's, there's a lot of moral questions about our society that are going to be brought to light as a result of this. Like, do, does it, if something feels real to us, does it matter if you can touch it or not? If you feel the same way as a result, does it, does it make a difference? Okay, there. I, I think, right, there's, like, I guess there's two points here. One is, um, I think we often have this conflation of the kind of physical as being the real and the virtual as being the kind of fictional or imaginary or something like that, right? And I think it's useful to disentangle those two things and say, you know, the digital can be real, the physical can be real, you know, the physical world can be kind of imaginary in certain ways too, right? And so, like, um, separating those two things can be useful when we're thinking about that. Um, I also think it's really useful, kind of response to Emma's point, to like trace the physicality of the virtual, right? So like one thing in the kind of Facebook version of the headset, um, if you want this like to be able to move around in some of these virtual spaces, in your physical space, you need like a six foot by six foot space clear of obstructions and you know like I don't have that kind of space in my apartment so like you know or people who have kids running around you know might not be able to use that so kind of what kind of physical space is necessary for these virtual spaces to exist and then we can go down the infrastructural chain and go to like down to the minerals required to go into those headsets too so like tracing those physical chains I think is useful for thinking through those questions Yeah, and I wanted just to also like kind of name that, and as you were saying, Richmond, that there's a way that like there are a lot of interfaces that we in engage with all the time that are almost like obfuscating or hiding what's behind them. Like I think about packaged meat at the store that is like sterilized and put inside a package, really nice for you to take home. That is hiding so much environmental destruction and um, torture or whatever. And uh, similarly, I think about Amazon too, where like you know the easier it is for us to like buy something or click something with on the interface, you know, kind of looks like as something really simple and easy. I come from an area in Southern California that has been essentially been fully colonized by warehouses, by Amazon and Walmart. And so uh, there are physical realities that are being hidden by some of these interfaces that we're kind of seeing, and they exist both on the virtual and in the physical. So I want to just thank all of our wonderful roundtable participants today. This has been incredibly thought-provoking, really wonderful to hear about your amazing art, your amazing scholarship. Um, let's just give them all a round of applause again. Thank you. So I do want to just call your attention in your pamphlet um, to the other events of the day. On the back, there is a map to get to the um, Anthropology and Art Practice Building. Some of you, of course, know this if you are on campus. Um, I do encourage you to come to our sessions. We'll keep exploring all of these ideas and more throughout the afternoon. Um, we'll have sessions coming up at 2.30, from 2.30 to 3.30. We will do Berkeley time, so we'll start 2.40, um, and then 4 to 5. Um, we'll follow that with a reception um, in the anthropology and art practice space. So we hope you join for all of that. Thank you again. Thank you for your wonderful questions. And thank you to our panelists and to our and organizers. Quick, and a quick final thank you to the organizers of the conference. Um, Morgan Ames speaking right now, Greg Niemeyer, Lisa Wymore, um, Hala Kadora, Katie Kalinowski, Rebecca Miller, Eric Nelson, Faye Pan, Dylan Thomas, Evelyn Thorne, and many more, and it says, and many more. Thank you so much for a wonderful event. Thank you.